www.coachfactor.it il primo podcast italiano per allenatori creato da allenatori Contaminarsi è sempre stato uno dei must di Coach Factor, l'abbiamo fatto in tutti i modi possibili, continuiamo a farlo e da oggi, oltre alla normale programmazione che ci accompagnerà nelle prossime settimane, nei prossimi mesi, inizieranno anche una serie di episodi in lingua inglese nei quali andremo a intervistare i migliori allenatori stranieri, ma soprattutto quelli che hanno avuto più esperienze all'estero in modo tale che ci possano raccontare e delle realtà diverse, dei modi diversi di pensare la pallavolo, di vivere la pallavolo, di allenare la pallavolo. Questo progetto è una joint venture con un'amica, una, eh, Clara Michael, che è una giocatrice professionista che ha un canale YouTube nel quale ogni settimana intervista allenatori, giocatori, nei quali insomma parla di pallavolo. Faremo questo percorso insieme. Se queste interviste sono di vostro gradimento, vi piacciono, pensate che siano un valore, possiamo anche pensare insieme a Ciro di eh, sottolare le lingue italiane per permettere a più allenatori italiani di eh, seguirci, anche se, eh, come vedrete, insomma, i termini usati, il linguaggio usato, i tanti errori fatti di grammatica permettono a chiunque abbia anche una leggera infrenatura di seguire e di ascoltare, ma soprattutto di imparare anche da questo nuovo format di www.coachfactor.it. Buon ascolto a tutti! Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Coach Factor, where the world's best volleyball coaches get together and talk about, you guessed it, coaching volleyball. <laughs> Today, Italian coach François Salvagni is speaking to Turkish coach Ferhat Akbash about everything from how they recruit players to the pros and cons of peppering. So whether you're a player or a coach, you're going to get a lot of value from this interview, so stick around. www.coachfactor.it Il primo podcast italiano per allenatori, creato da allenatori. What's up guys? My name is Key Michael and I'm a professional volleyball player. I've been doing that for 10 years. And if I'm not a volleyball coach, then what the heck am I doing here? Well, this episode is really special because it's one of the few episodes that Coach Factor has done in English. So Francois asked me to come here and give you guys a sneak peek of what you're about to hear. First of all, if you guys don't know these two coaches, they are two of the greats. Francois, you probably already know because he's one of the hosts of Coach Factor and he's been coaching in Italy, in Algeria, in Azerbaijan, in Romania for the past 20 years, almost. And he's now coaching in Malouf, France, which is where we met last year. And Ferhat has worked alongside some of the biggest names in coaching women's volleyball, from Lang Ping to Massimo Barbolini to Giovanni Viretti. He's coached with the national teams of China and Turkey, as well as some of the most well-known names in club volleyball from Galatasaray to CSM Bucharest to Baki Funk. So it goes without saying that both of these coaches know the game of volleyball, but it's really interesting to hear them talking about their different styles of coaching and how they approach the game differently. For example, they talk about how they recruit players for their team. Do you start with a setter who has a really fast game or do you prefer to recruit first the libero and the receiver so that you make sure that you have a solid foundation in pass? They talk about where on the net is the best place for the setter to receive the ball. They talk about running six on six drills and whether you always need to have a score or a target. And if volleyball is a 360 degree game, is peppering front on with your partner really the best way to warm up? There's so much value in this conversation, whether you're a player or a coach, there's something that you can take away today and implement immediately the next time that you step on the court. So enjoy the conversation and stick around to the end of the video if you want to hear my top takeaways from the conversation. www.coachfactor.it Il primo podcast italiano per allenatori, creato da allenatori. So we talked about our next season game. So now all of us are in the market. And so it's interesting if you can tell us how you choose your players, which kind of skills you are looking for to create your best starting six. So uh, I can give this example from my current team or generally, how you want. As you want. 
So first of all, when we go to a team, especially if it is in another country, you have some players already has contracts. So then you have to build the other ones. In my opinion, uh, because I try to play very fast, I really need a setter that can play this game because all of the players in senior level, they don't have this education. So, for example, when I was in Romania first season, I had uh, different setters. But second of second year of mine, I brought a Japanese setter. So in po in Poland, uh, I had a Polish setter. She's national team setter. After Volo, she plays second. Malena uh, Kokolewska. So uh, she's very good setter. Uh, but she didn't know know the fast game. She had she has the contract. She's good. So I choose this girl. I said this girl we can improve, and she was really one of my best players. So I was very happy. So first thing that I check generally is setter and if the pass comes good. So who receives is the key. Libero receivers. You know after then you can play this game. Then depending on your budget you can have a good strong opposite, good strong middle as much as possible because you know to play fast game you need a quick uh, middle blocker that makes many kind of step work so that's why for example to my current team last season to Hemik Polisa I brought my uh, middle blocker that I worked for three years because she can go front of the setter or behind the setter so I, I took her and the other ones learn from her actually how to how my system goes so uh, this season was a lot easier because this season i have a base of the team i have around uh, eight nine players that was already with me and i just try to put some uh, good players to the position so it happens depending how you choose your team more than the players it was the same for me because for me this season was really more easy to create the next season team because I know some players, I know the level of my leagues, and I choose what why I miss last season. Uh, but for example, in the last interview with Silvano Prandi, he told me that for him, for example, about middle blocker, the most important thing now is serve and attack. For me, this season, last month, when I choose my middle blocker, I make a lot of focus on block. So mm -hmm. what's the idea when you choose your middle blocker? So, very good question, because when I go to Hemik Polizze, my target about middle blocker was having a good attack to kill the ball as much as possible with fast game, quick game. But when we finish all the season, when I come today, I can see that, okay, we had a very good attack. For example, I play final of cup, Polish Cup. Uh, middles were killing 68% with 24 attacks, so it's a huge number. But uh, in the end, you can see that, okay, attack is important, but without, without block, is getting very difficult. So next season, uh, I try to change my mentality about that. So I, I get some middle blockers, uh, actually maybe you know very well these players, that have big potential, that can be good at blocking, but attack, they have to work. So uh, in my opinion, I try to keep this time left side and right side much more stronger attack, but middle blocker, I want to have better middle blockers that make blocking. So depending on the team, but both of them is very important. Middle blocker and middle attacker, these are different games, but some players can make it both. For, ex for example, Robin de Cruyff makes both, that's why she's Robin de Cruyff. Or Rasic, the same, that kind of players we need to have. So we need to work both. But block is very important, especially when you have opponent that plays slow game. In Poland, generally the game is slow, so I want to focus much more to block. I made the same. About outside detail, I have this feeling last season that I missed something in attack. So I prefer to choose one really strong attack, Ivana Vanyak. She was the, the best scorer in Germany last season. She's not uh, really stable in passing. So I, have, mm -hmm. I will work really hard with her and with my passing line. Fortunately, my libero is really good. And Elena Cazot, French young uh, outside eater, she's amazing in passing. So I will work really hard to find uh, a good quality in passing. But it's true that I prefer to choose one outside eater really strong in attack. 
And uh, so about this, what is your opinion? Is better is... to have choose table passing player or sometimes you have to choose one strong attacker too? In my opinion, for example, I give an, another situation from my team. I have very good libero. I have two very good uh, receivers from Polish league. They both play in Polish national team, Greiber and Magic. So my pass was already good. So as you did, I take a player with less good pass that she was Vilma Salas from Cuba. Okay, I know so I, I said that I will risk myself with her pass and she will attack strong. But when you have two good receivers, the third one gets better and better. So for example, Vilma Salas numbers, when you check in the end, was better than the others. So I always think that left side, minimum one player needs to be risky. For example, when we watch all the world, let's talk from the national teams, you can always find two strong attackers, one opposite, one left side. So if you can create this with good middle and good pass, this is plus. But I don't believe that, you know, for example, I work in Japan. In Japan, the game quality always goes with less good attack, but good pass. But you have a limit. You can be world six, but world first is difficult. I mean... Yeah. I mean, attack is key. Attack is key. Last season in our league, we have Bézier. They choose to work with only two passing players because they have amazing outside hitter and uh, Terrell. And she's not able to pass at all. So they prefer to work with two passing players. And at the end, it was good. So do you think that it's still possible to have only two passing players in female volleyball and play for top level? This is a very good example. Serbia national team is like the book of this system, in my opinion, because they pass, I say, two, two and a half people, not three, not two, but two and a half people. Now the same Polish national team tries to do that. They have Stishak and Smajek and they want to pass with one player. So in my opinion, it is possible, but in long term, uh, you know, the receivers need to have quality because anyways, you need to play out of system ball. You need to have great hitters. So in my opinion, this kind of teams needs to have big budgets. If you have very strong attackers, then you can pass two people. But if the other players have some difficulty to kill the ball, for example, if you have Mihailovic, okay, she killed the ball anyways. But if you don't have Mihailovic, to pass with two people will be difficult. I tried this when I have a good opposite. I took also Jovana Brakocevic. Uh, it was a, it happened two season ago, and you know my opposite. I put her to left side because Brakocevic is good at right side, and I pass with two people. But it worked that moment for three months. But I don't know if we work for ten months the same system. Some teams would kill us with that, sir, you know, but didn't happen. I was lucky. I respect the system, but with good attackers, for sure. When I asked this question to Marco Fenoglio, he told me, OK, I'm working to, to bring in my team, Paola Gonu and Samantha Fabris, and it will be great. I said, yes, it can be a good idea. <laughs> yeah, so I give the same example. You know, if I am Mihailovic, if I have Egono, OK, thank you so much. I don't need that much pass, but you need these players in that moment. You, you already said that uh, your idea of uh, female volleyball now is to try to play as fast as possible. Can you explain a little bit better what you mean? I mean that, you know, uh, especially in Europe, I see and I grow with the same culture that uh, setters jump and try as much as possible a quick game. So when I go to Far East, I saw a little bit different systems. So I find out that jumping of the setter is not always a necessary case. I mean, sometimes it's necessary, it can be, but a setter always jumps is not sometimes good. So I focus, especially when I come to Europe, I focus on my setters not to jump always, to find the best position to set good, because when a setter is stable without jumping, the attacker knows how to approach because you need to have a how do you say a good rhythm automatic rhythm of attacking so if you 
don't show her the situation, she doesn't know when to start. So I always say to my setters, jump as less as possible, because when you jump, you go more distance to far, you jump left side, you jump vertical, you don't know how much you will jump. So I try to fix first this, and then after I try to uh, manage the game, not just setting, also pass, also defense with low height. Wow. So, so I don't want to have a very high set because I always experience that when have, there is a very high set, high pass, sorry, the setter quality goes down. This is my personal opinion. Of course, you cannot calculate this, but with my uh, vision, I see this. So I focus that low pass, low defense is always good because also the opponent has less time to prepare. So I try to put all the game down as much as possible. So that makes the game fast. This is interesting about defense because as you know, for a lot of years, everybody says, when you defense, the most important thing is to try to put the ball higher as possible. Yeah, yeah. So I grow up. I grew up with the same culture, the same education, but when I go to Far East, I saw that actually this is not true. Because if you have good timing, good skills, you can play the game as low as possible. When I go to my new teams, first thing that first problem that I have is this because the it's comfortable to play very high for also the players. So they have more time, they they have more time to make step but I push them to play low. In the beginning, they hate it. But maximum, maximum two weeks, three weeks, they start to love it because the game rhythm gets better. So that's why I try to change this. This makes the game a lot faster. About this, what's your target in the net? I mean, uh, what do you ask to your player to put the easy ball and, uh, in the net for your setter? I mean, the, for the height or for to get? Okay, I didn't explain so well. If you prefer to have the ball in the middle of the net, little bit on the right of the net, was so, because okay. Also in Europe, the culture is this. Uh, can I show it from here? So, settle is somewhere close to zone two, right? Yes. So I keep it in my mentality. I keep it always in the middle. The pass in the middle. The reception in the middle, the free ball is in the middle. Everything is in the middle because when you play a fast game, this distance and this distance are equal. So a middle blocker has much more trouble. But if you play with a team that doesn't read the game, the middle blocker come close and this distance doesn't make a sense. So I keep the same distance from the middle as much as possible. I also, totally I totally agree with you. It's really hard at the beginning of the season because players don't love it, but after they start to understand that it's really interesting. And uh, about plays fast, it's really interesting for me to ask you, because now everybody try to play with four players every time in attack, if this is your idea, or if you prefer to do something different sometimes. I try to play four people at, as much as possible, four people attack. Uh, of course, when you go fast, it is something different. Because, uh, you know, also the, how do you call in English, I don't know, but there is 12, there is B, I mean the uh, shorter dif distances, longer distances. These are little bit problems to create the game for people especially. But I create this game depending on my opposite, where she attacked the most, like in a good way, from pipe or zone one. If I have a good pipe player, I try to use it as much as possible pipe. But for example, last season I have, as I mentioned, Vilma Salas, she's left side hitter and she was great from pipe. So I use my other Kuban, Giselle Silva from zone one. So it means that my middle blocker to fast needs to go in between. It, it's a little bit more complicated. I need, maybe I need more to explain, but I try to use my middle depending on my second line attackers much more. What do you think about the attack from zone 5 and zone 6? Do you use it? Do you love it or not? I tried I tried three three four seasons ago it was totally different team different format when I try when I work for Turkish national team because that game that team was a slower team that moment that generation was slower and that generation was not so young so I kept that team to play slower 
So that's why I start to use this between uh, XQ attacks between five and six, between one and six. But that moment, you know, if you don't work it enough, uh, it is not so effective. I love it, but in my opinion, to make it, you need to work a lot. Especially the attacker needs to repeat this a lot. So I didn't try this after that moment because I focus on the speed of the game. So zone five, zone six in between depend on the team. It will be the last thing that I will work on. I try to make these distances with the middle blockers. And about the uh, seven, the first tempo far from the setter, what do you ask to your middle blocker? Because some coach prefer to have always the same distance from the setter, or other coach prefer to have one point in the net every time, five from there. What's your idea? About from what I know, uh, also Italian culture, American culture, you guys have the same distance always. Is that true? Yes. It's true. And, uh, when I when I work with the Italians, they say that they have the same distances. So I make like this in the beginning of the season. I have let's say four middle blockers. I make a meeting. I say, girls, what you want? You want the distance the same, or you want to keep the distance always? So the player choose. I say, she says, I will choose that distance. The other one says, I will choose the stable distance. Okay, we go for it. So with X player, I go with that distance. With the other player, I go to the other one, but the, all the team knows it. So uh, I try to make combination a lot. Only thing that I don't like is, uh, how do you call G? I mean, first tempo and seven. Between there is a ball, G, it's called G, right? I don't know, in Italian. So that, that ball I don't like because it cuts all my combinations. I cannot make nine. I cannot make my left side inside, so this kind of combinations cuts me. So I like a clear seven or a clear first tempo. Uh, between them, I don't like. This is only my rule about the distances. The players decide, and I go for it. It's not a problem. Okay, now uh, I'm really curious to talk about how you create your practice. This is the most important part for uh, the people, the coaches that listen to Coach Factor. Because at the end, of our target is to give them some information to go immediately in the gym. Okay, now after COVID, <laughs> to go in the gym and work with uh, their team. So, uh, is, I want to put focus now about your practice. You come in the gym, okay, you finish warm up, doesn't matter how. And after, how you create your progression? So, this a lot, uh, you know, to answer this question, it depends which kind of conditions you have. For example, I am very lucky that I have two or three gyms on the court. So, I mean court. So, I can divide the team a lot. So, if you are a coach that you have more than one court, in my opinion, the first part of the practice needs to be always ball touch. I mean ball touch, what can be? What is you, what your team needs? A defense work or let's say some reception repetition or some set. You, I give this repetition a lot. So if you don't have two courts or three courts, you can create some uh, organization in one court the same and you can use the sides. So when I make this, first thing that I do is a lot of ball repetition because I think and I believe that how much a player touch the ball doesn't matter wrong or good. I mean, maybe she makes a wrong repetition. Doesn't matter, she makes a repetition. Of course, as a coach, we have to tell them to fix, we have to explain them, we need to help them, but even touching the ball is something good. So this part I give minimum 35-40 minutes, if I have enough time, repetition, a lot repetition. I don't like a lot, we call pepper, you know, yeah. two people play. I don't like it too much because uh, volleyball is 360 degree game. You know, you need to use all your left, right, behind, front, but pepper is front and front, front and front. So it's not very natural. So I try to change this. So the ball comes from another way. So she needs to set that way. So I don't keep this pepper work a lot. For example, when I work in Japan, it was a big problem for me because when I organize the practices, I don't put pepper. So the Japanese players are not happy after two, three weeks and they are really shy. They don't tell this. 
after the other coaches told me that you know they grow up with pepper very long repetition so even if you don't feel like uh, it is useful if you put two minutes it's good for them because they feel like they are warm up okay so i i keep the same rhythm for european players because this is a habit from the junior level okay play pepper but not more than two three minutes then i start to make a lot of jumps jump start from block in my opinion because block jump is easiest or if the uh, coach doesn't prefer to make block first they can start with jump serve like easy jump float serve this is another way to warm up in my opinion and then i work a lot blocking because block skill is something is not about talent in my opinion too much but about repetition so i feel that this repetition is important then after i put for sure depending on my time two or one game i mean six against six these six against six games i create these games about our next opponent or about our needs so as a coach this is the most difficult part for me because i am playing against a team and i know the opponent team has this how do you say style to play so i need to write a drill that fits to opponent team so generally not i don't believe that the other coaches make this a lot i don't go with the uh, classic six against six games that i learned in my past life i was doing it like i used this two three years i was copy paste uh, making the drills and making the practices but actually it doesn't fit to my style so i always create a new drill depending on the opponent so it takes a lot of time so i'm just thinking looking you know which kind of drill it is not so easy but you have to think a lot about this to not to be a classic coach because in my opinion in the world there are many good coaches that can make great practices but do we need that practice as a player this is the question i think we talk a lot about exercise because sometimes you have this feeling that your team become uh, better and better in make exercise but not in play volleyball this exactly is so you exactly. are to do some exercise, but at the end you have to play volleyball. So at the end, the most important thing is the feedback, no? Is uh, how you can take your job inside the game. And for exactly. this, okay. some uh, explanation about your practice. So after this part in which you touch the ball, I, if I understand well, your target is about sensibility, no? Exactly. You, touch the ball, you feel you become better to handle the ball. And exactly. After this, you immediately start with 6-6 six, six, or sometimes you put some exercise, for example, synthesis, synthetic, in which you have some specific targets. In my opinion, uh, to go from that moment to 6 against 6 is very risky. You will have many injuries if you don't put something in between. So after that 30, 35, 40 minutes work, I always put a kind of preparation to 6 against 6. It takes around like 25 minutes something like this and this is mostly the part that i say i work easy block work individual because i divide the courts i use two courts three courts so i use blocking serving still liberos has some defense you know to prepare to six against six i need to make almost everything because i suggest to the coaches don't forget that when you play six against six you make everything so it means that the player has to be ready for it. So you need to put some block exercise for sure. You need to put some attack exercise for sure. Maybe in easy way, maybe in difficult way. It depends on you, but you need to put it. I still, in my opinion, I still think that even that part needs to be a lot of repetition. So I know volleyball is a game which is very stable. People don't uh, run. They don't touch the ball a lot, actually. But in the practice if you want a good rhythm if you want players have focus you need to give them always something that i have, they are busy with and it's the ball so if you make them wait in the line if you make them wait on the other side of the court this girl is not doing it and she doesn't have focus so i always give something it is about ball that they are busy with and i try to give some targets games of course some easy games uh, to give the motivation, 
but I don't keep it a lot long because I try to work six against six a lot longer as much as possible because especially in season time uh, during the games we don't have a lot of time to uh, make the team work because you know you come from travel the next day needs to be easier practice then you need to focus on the other team so uh, it is hard because it's hard to explain from here which kind of work you do because it always changes each week is another story one important question when you start to play six versus six is immediately with score or you sometimes you keep some exercise six six in which you don't have score and you put focus for example in uh, skills this de this depends on the opponent a lot for example i play a, let's say a derby very strong opponent or i play a very critical final i don't find it necessary to put some uh, score because the girls has already a great focus they have it and they are already tight so that kind of situations i put what i need as the opponent but i don't put any score i don't want to make it m more tight but for example we have an easy opponent next week and the girls have low focus for sure i put some targets so at least in the practice i keep the competition high then after it goes easier so also, scoring depends on the situation what we have. One really hard question for me, for myself, is how to handle 6-6 six, six, uh, in this way. Because I love to create connection with my player, but at the same time, I need some time, my best uh, opposite, for example, spiking from two versus my starting six. Or I need my best blocker player in uh, uh, team B because it's more difficult for my player. So for this reason, I talk a lot of it up with uh, Giovanni Guidetti because he loves to change every time the, the starting six. And uh, for me, now I'm, I, I work more mixing the player. Before I was more focused in six starting six versus team B. So I want to know what's your opinion about it. My opinion, I totally agree with you and also uh, what Giovanni thinks. But the way that I think is a little different. You know, when you give, when you, the players are very smart. So the players, when you put a drill, they know if they will play or not. I mean, they understand it. Maybe in the first one, they are not sure. But at the second one, if you put the same way, they will understand it. So first reason that I always mix the players is this, because I, if I make this, there are some players going down. They are, there are some players that are very excited. So I don't want this in the practice. This is something that should be in the game as much as possible. So I always mix the players. And the other thing that, in my opinion, I do a lot different than the coaches, especially in Europe, I don't separate the work. I mean, the opposite attacks the same as the left side from the left side and the left side player attacks the same level as the right side hitter. So they work at zone 2, zone 4, equal. So I don't have an opposite that attack from 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2 and finish the practice. They have to attack from 5, they have to attack from left side and I try to balance this a lot. So that's why I we use that system. I don't know uh, if all the coaches have this option because it's not so easy to uh, buy it. It's something, some cost. So I use with my physical preparator a lot, very focused way. How much he jump from that side, how much he jump that side, how much he has jump all the practice. So this is a very big criteria to understand your work. So after the practice is finished, I always check. Did I make a good drill? Did I write a good drill that has good, equal, balanced jump for everybody? So uh, I try to make it balanced. In the game, we have a six. And it's not top six, in my opinion. Everybody is our player, so they need to be ready anytime. Can you tell us what can be a good uh, range about jumps in one practice, for example, for your middle, for your outside hitter and the opposite, to have an it's idea? In my opinion, you know, especially middle blockers are jumping the most in the practices. And if you have this system, that systems, you need to be very careful about setter jumps because 
setters are jumping very small but it is still on the uh, how do you say system so it looks like they jump very high very so you need to know the volleyball at the same time in my opinion if you are over 120 130 in one practice that player is in danger about injury because it is a kind of overload but uh, i try to come to that line i try to make them jump at least at these levels i don't want to finish a practice with 50 60 jumps because it's not natural work of course in the morning when you make a fitness and ball maybe you can make it very less jump it's i understand but in a team practice you need to make over 100 jump is good i mean if you want to control the practice 80 jumps i understand but low less is i think too less yes when i talk about it with giovanni he told me that normally middle blocker in his uh, practice is uh, around 100 it depends uh, in how we count these jumps no if we if you count all in uh, six six uh, or if you start to count for example when you said about uh, warm up in block i never count these jumps because for me it's still warm up so normally i use 120 but i count all the jumps in start in six six so how is working uh, your team exactly and i i want to give one example i have a player called iga vasilevska and she's my middle blocker and this girl is not a very tall middle blocker she's a short middle blocker so she has steps is the, these are kind of jumps i mean the system counts it like a jump so this girl is always 160 180 she's always overload but in the end we find out that it's not true for her she's making kind of the same things with the other middle blockers but with a lot of number so for example to understand this I started to count myself, you know, how they change, is it because of their changing in the practice in six against six? So I control and I see after that, Iga Vasilevska is a different case. So you need to know the system, you need to experience it, at the same time you need to know players, how their anatomy, how their uh, biomechanic work, you need to see this. About rhythm, you make a, a really important uh, sentence about that uh, normally uh, our player need uh, to feel that the rhythm is always higher because uh, it's more uh, easy for them to stay focused in the, in the practice. But it's true that sometimes our game are really slow. So you try sometimes to make some totally different practices or not? Some practices I do like this. When I come to the game day, let's say one day before, I try to keep the, I repeat, in important games, I try to keep the practice as less intense as possible. So they are much more relaxed. Generally, I don't know why or I cannot prove this, but before the game days, even the team has incredible focus. The practices are not good level. I don't know why. This, I mean, even if you push, uh, the players has a reaction. They are tight. They are not so good. So one day before, I experienced that if you don't have great intensive work if you don't push them if the practice is slow it is more useful so that's why one day before i try to keep a lot of work about serve reception so serve receive is kind of easier work but in this work you need to keep your receivers much more calm because some receivers when they work in the practice especially one day before and if they don't pass good they have some troubles they have some mental problems so when i see as a coach when i see this I try to change that player immediately or I try to change the drill immediately to, to give the comfort to that player. So uh, maybe it's a good trick from my side, it works sometimes, but to, to make it, you need to know the player very well, if she's frustrated, if she's happy or not. And one really interesting uh, question about practice, I have this feeling that sometimes my player know that every day we make these steps to be ready to make a good 6-6. Six, six. So it means that sometimes they already know the rhythm of my practice. So in the last few seasons, I try to, to sometimes to make something totally different. And for example, I go in the gym and immediately we make 6-6. Six, six. And okay, it's normal that we make a great warm-up with the physical coach. We are not stupid at all. But 
and uh, it works really great. So because exactly. sometimes I think you have to destroy your practice because they need to have different, uh, uh, how can I say, different, Action. yes. So do, do you try to do something like that? Sometimes you try to do something totally different or not? Exactly. Uh, I make it uh, with this kind of way. I mean, changing the drills into a practice, but sometimes I do it by changing the practices totally. For example, I give six against six practice in the morning when they are fresh, but they are not ready. So afternoon, let's say some weights and easy repetition. So this kind of changes is giving a lot of focus, a lot of refreshment to the player. I totally agree with you. So when you give the off days in different moments, for example, you give an off day on Wednesday, but you keep working. I don't like it too much. But if you have a very, let's say, junior level team, if you have a 16 years old kids work, if you make it, it can be different for them. But in senior level, you cannot do that. That if you have to work that day, you have to work that day because you don't have something else. But for junior levels, also the coach can play with the day of the practice. Why not? I play with the time of the practice. For example, when we go to travel somewhere with a bus, I make practice in the morning, six against six, maximum jump, teamwork, everything is perfect. Then we go to way. At night, they rest. So it is not always good, but sometimes it's good, depending on the team organization. And I totally agree with you. I have this feeling that sometimes, uh, for example, morning practice sometimes is amazing. You no. Know? Uh, for example, okay, 10, 30, 11 a.m., uh, your team plays 6 is amazing because they are fresh, they put a lot of energy, and sometimes they know that after this practice, they have all afternoon uh, for free. free and yeah. it works a lot because sometimes we are afraid, but I think that, uh, okay, we can do what we want because we are a professional team. For some coaches, not so easy. But sometimes if you can, switch the timing, switch the organization of your practice, do something totally different, works really good. Exactly. For example, Lang Ping, a Chinese coach, loves this. She works in the morning, team practice very long, and afternoon maybe it's free, maybe there is just weights. But for example, in China, the teams work a lot team practice in the morning, a lot. I mean, of course, these players quit volleyball at 29 years old, maybe it's difficult for them, but they make it that way and they make a very long team practice in the morning. I totally agree. It's, for example, when you go to USA, Karch Kirale team, because of their gym conditions, because they are working in California, they make team practice in the morning. So, uh, I mean, in Europe, we need to finish this case. I mean, not jumping in the morning, not jumping at midnight. Jumping is something that we can do anytime. It's not like time limits. We don't have time limits. And uh, do you try some time? Because I talk about it with uh, Enyan, the coach of uh, Poland, and uh, men Poland, about uh, he, he give to the, his player the opportunity to choose if you go on practice or not. Okay, we talk about individual uh, practice. You try to do some this sometimes or not? So I do like this. Uh, I try to keep the positive atmosphere in the team as much as possible. So women are complicated. Women are different. So if a woman thinks that she is working unnecessarily more than another one, and we are losing or winning because of that reason, the team atmosphere can be a problem. So, of course, at the same time, I give some freedom. Individual work is something individual. So, I learn also at Japan this. So, we have a work. We have six against six or whatever, long practice, two, three hours, doesn't matter. You make it as the team. The individual part, if the gym is uh, available, you need to come yourself. You need to work hard as you want. The coach can help you, whatever, but you need to work it. This individual part, if you want to improve, you know what to improve, is your free time. It's free. If you don't do it, I will not tell you something. But my individual practices that I find it necessary, for example, when I make weights practice, I make the group in three, and I say that, okay, 
these three group you need to come ball you need to make this and that if they don't if they say that okay i don't want to do it in the morning for example a middle blocker comes coach i'm 35 years old i don't want to jump in the morning i i, I don't i cannot work in the blo block okay then come afternoon early make this job before the practice or after the practice you have to make this practice because the other of the other girls needs to see that okay i jumped in the morning she jumped in the afternoon but we jump so i think freedom is very good but we need to control that if they make enough repetition exactly Hello, thanks a lot. You give us a lot of uh, really interesting suggestions because at the end you have amazing experience in Turkish, in Poland, in Romania, in uh, Japan, so it was really great. If you want to finish all it, too, if you have one secret, one suggestion to give to all people that listen to Coach Factor, something that you love to do or something that you think is stupid to do, something you can suggest to our uh, Coach Factor followers. Hard, hard to say that, you know, if you want to be a good coach, in my opinion, first thing, you have to be yourself, the best version of yourself. Uh, of course, watch the other coaches, watch a lot what is happening around, but try to know that you cannot be like the others. You need to be yourself. And second thing, our job is very difficult, something crazy. So if you don't uh, love volleyball, quit this job, do something else, because this sport can be done if you love it so if you love it you will find out the way just keep going working that's what i can say yes it's 24 hour work you never yeah. stop to think of volleyball during the season so okay. thanks a lot my friend it was great for me it was my first time in english so i say sorry for my english but at the end i think we put a lot of focus in, in the volleyball this is the most important thing so good luck for this part of our strange season after covid and uh, we will meet maybe if we are lucky we can meet in champions league next season why not hope to see you soon thank you so much thank you so much <laughs> thanks a lot ciao bye bye, bye. Well, was I exaggerating or did you guys get so much value from this conversation between two top coaches discussing their different training styles? I think I know the answer to that. <laughs> For me, it was really interesting to hear Ferrat talk about the distance from the setter as an attacker in the middle. So he asks his players specifically at the beginning of the season whether or not they prefer when they're running a quick set behind or in front, if they want to keep that distance from the setter as she moves or if they prefer to keep the fixed point on the net and the, no matter where the setter goes, she always puts the ball at the same spot. That was really interesting for me because that's a discussion we have every single year. When you change teams, when you change setters, you always have to clarify that right from the beginning. And I'd never heard of this counting jumps method. That is incredible to me. And I really wish we had had something like that on our team this year, because I'm telling you, when you're a grandma like me and like my other middle last season on the team, we started counting our own jumps because we were exhausted guys if you got some value out of this interview like i did and you want to see more interviews in english make sure you hit the like button and subscribe and leave a comment down below letting the coach factor guys know who you would like to see interviewed next and if you're a player and you want to see more about life as a professional volleyball player in europe you can always come over and find me on my youtube channel just type in key michael in the search and i'm sure it will show up other than that thanks so much for listening and we'll see you in the next one www.coachfactor.it, il primo podcast italiano per allenatori, creato da allenatori.